Chapter 11, Lesson 4. In this lesson, we'll take a look at um, some ideas about um, liquid solids and gases. And the first one we'll take a look at is something called vapor pressure. Now, this is a very important concept. Uh, and to define vapor pressure, we'll have to take a look at um, something called the bell curve of uh, temperature. And the bell curve is applied to uh, any time a system has a big population because any time we're dealing with a substance, chemical substance, you literally have billions and billions of molecules. So you have to treat it as a population. Now, in general, uh, the bell curve uh, shows most particles having roughly an average amount of energy with some a very high amount of energy and some very low amount of energy. But whenever you increase the temperature, what happens is the bell curve flattens out and extends a little bit, giving you a higher amount of molecules with uh, high, very high energies. And this line essentially is a threshold beyond which if molecules um, reach, they'll evaporate essentially, they'll come off the, uh, the liquid into the gas phase. This is essentially the line that separates liquid from gas. So vapor pressure, as we'll see, uh, is a measure of how many of these molecules escape the liquid phase. So this is another visual way of seeing what vapor pressure is. Anytime you have liquid, that liquid it starts to evaporate. And as that liquid evaporates, um, a bunch of the uh, gas above the liquid creates some pressure. And this is actually uh, seen at equilibrium here in this instance. At equilibrium meaning that um, there is no net change between evaporation and condensation. Both processes are occurring simultaneously. And then we can measure the pressure uh, that the gas is exerting. And this pressure will be constant. And this pressure essentially is what we mean by vapor pressure. Uh, now let's we'll define something called volatility. Volatility essentially is how easily a substance evaporates and essentially it's how uh, volatile something is is how easily it goes into the gas phase from the liquid phase and this is connected to intermolecular bonds the weaker the bonds the more volatile the substance is hexane as we've seen has uh, evaporates very quickly and that's because it has a very weak bonds between its molecules it is nonpolar this is a, a, a heating curve uh, for uh, not a heating curve but a, um, a vapor pressure temperature curve so what this shows, if you take a look at water, uh, any substance, uh, as you heat up the substance, uh, we have temperature here along the x-axis and vapor pressure along the y. Any substance, liquid substance, as it's heated, its vapor pressure increases. This is because more molecules have enough energy to escape into the gas phase, so the pressure of the gas phase increases. And this is a very, uh, it's essentially an exponential type of increase for water, and whenever water uh, the vapor pressure of water equals the atmospheric pressure, which in this case is 760 torr, then by definition the substance boils. So the boiling point or the normal boiling point uh, of a substance is defined as uh, the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the water equals the vapor pressure of the atmosphere. So you, you can see that um, something like ethyl alcohol uh, boils at 78.3 degrees Celsius. That's because its vapor pressure under one atmosphere conditions is uh, is or, or its vapor pressure reaches 760 at 78.3 degrees Celsius. That's another way to look at it. Now let's quickly take a look at some phase diagrams. Hopefully these are familiar to you. If not, then we'll discuss them here. A phase diagram essentially shows you the three phases of any substance. Uh, under temperature and pressure conditions. It turns out that you can alter the state a substance is in but uh, by not only increasing temperature or decreasing temperature but also by adjusting pressure. So you can make a solid into a liquid for example by changing the pressure. Um, we'll take a look at these in a little more detail. So uh, we'll begin with the triple point which is in the middle here. Um, and this is a point, a strange point, in which all three phases or states exist in equilibrium. And if you vary the conditions and make the temperature and pressure just right, you can actually get solid and liquid and gas all at the same time uh, in, in your test tube. So a, a little closer look at this. Uh, what you see is um, coming away from the triple point in every direction. This is the boundary. I'm going to go along the uh, liquid-gas boundary. 
This is the solid liquid boundary and this is the solid gas boundary along with the corresponding phase changes that we've talked about. So vaporization, condensation, melting, freezing, and sublimation, deposition. And this happens at different temperatures and different pressures. So, and the, the triple point ends up here. Uh, and this is something called the critical point of a substance. This is a point at which uh, you can see the gas and the liquid uh, become indistinguishable. So at very high temperatures, at very high pressures, you get like a, a substance that's both a gas and a liquid. Uh, it can be compressed as a gas, but it flows much more like a liquid. This is called a supercritical fluid. And uh, these are actually pretty important in, in uh, industrial chemical operations. So uh, this is your uh, liquid solid boundary. So what you see, and the melting point then is across whenever time you, anytime you cross this boundary. So two things you can do. You can change a substance from a solid to a liquid by increasing temperature. This is along the x-axis. Um, or you can also do the same thing by increasing pressure. Notice from here to here, all I have to do is increase pressure and the substance will uh, change phases from, in this case, from a liquid to a solid. By decreasing the pressure, I can make it go the other way. Same thing along the deposition sublimation curve. Uh, you can increase the pressure and cause a gas to become a solid, which makes sense. If you're compressing the molecules closer together, eventually they'll solidify, they'll come together. Or if you decrease the pressure, the molecules will fly apart. You can think of that as well. And this depends on the temperature. Um, we're going to take a look at the phase diagram for carbon dioxide. It turns out carbon dioxide is very famously studied uh, for the phase diagram uh, because carbon dioxide is uh, what's called, this is what's called dry ice. Carbon dioxide goes uh, through, goes from directly from a solid to a gas without going through the liquid phase under regular conditions. Uh, and this is a picture of a supercritical carbon dioxide, which you see it's a very strange, you got a liquid here, this is a liquid portion, and then you got a, the gaseous portion, and you got these wisps of uh, kind of like vapor, uh, carbon dioxide vapor, visible vapor, that's, you know, little tiny particles of condensed um, carbon dioxide and gas. So we could definitely make um, carbon dioxide into a liquid, and this is what you're seeing here, and this liquid version of carbon dioxide is very useful for chemists to do a bunch of extracting uh, type of reactions. So we're going to compare um, water's phase diagram with the phase diagram of CO2. What you'll see uh, is uh, that uh, the water has a high critical temperature and pressure, so 374 degrees C under 218 atmosphere. That's a very, very high critical temperature and pressure. Um, and that's due to the fact that water has strong intermolecular forces. Remember, water has hydrogen bonding associated with um, its mo molecules. And that essentially is why. What you'll see also is that the slope here, uh, the solid-liquid slope, is negative. Now what this means, technically, is uh, if you were to increase, if you had water as a solid, and then if you were to increase the pressure, uh, pressure increasing, what you'll do is you'll turn water into a liquid. Now this is strange because you're, you've got water as a solid, nice and orderly arranged particles, and then you're, you're applying pressure onto them. And as you apply pressure to them, it melts. Now this is the opposite of what we're used to, and that's because water exists uh, it is more dense as a liquid, so you're forcing the molecules together, you're increasing the density, and it becomes a liquid. Most phase diagrams show uh, a positive slope in this, in this region, but water shows negative slope. This is unique to water. In fact, take a look at the carbon dioxide uh, boundary, the solid-liquid boundary. It, it definitely has a positive slope, is the idea. So, um, and here it just says that uh, below about five atmospheres, um, carbon dioxide will go directly from a solid to a gas. Uh, so if you have uh, carbon dioxide, dry ice, uh, under uh, anything under five atmosphere, it'll go directly, it'll sublimate. Okay, lastly, we'll talk about uh, uh, solids. <coughs> Oops. And solids can be thought of as falling into two groups, crystalline 
uh, in which you have a highly ordered arrangement of particles and amorphous, no form amorphous means no form, randomly arranged particles. We'll take a look at each one of these. Um, this is uh, the example here is silicon dioxide. Now silicon dioxide is essentially glass uh, or quartz, uh, essentially sand. And now anytime silicon dioxide uh, is made very slowly, you'll get a very ordered arrangement of its particles. So if you take a look at the molecular level, you'll see a very ordered arrangement as you see in this picture here. Um, if you take a look at the three-dimensional unit, you'll see this tetrahedral arrangement essentially with silicon in the middle and oxygen on the outside, very nicely ordered. But you can also form an amorphous uh, version of silicon dioxide, and this is what glass is. Glass is usually just, you take a quartz sand, melt it, and then freeze it quickly, and you get yourself an amorphous arrangement. You still see silicon and oxygen combined, but in a much more random arrangement. Uh, this is also why ice, if cooled slowly enough, will actually form these beautiful snowflakes. And what you'll see is you'll see uh, six sides, one, two, three, four, five, six, to the every snowflake. Uh, and this pattern is reflective of the fact that on the molecular level, ice forms these ordered six patterned arrangements, is the idea. So, uh, you know, don't forget to uh, give a snow snowflake postcard to your friends this uh, holiday season. Um, and then uh, we can take a look and we can study these crystalline arrangements. We're not going to do too much with this, but we want to at least um, expose you to this idea. Uh, because a crystalline solid, by definition, is very ordered in its arrangement, we can actually study the details of this order. So because there's a repeating pattern, we can take a look at something called the unit cell. So we can take a piece of this repeating pattern and study it in, the more, in more detail. And, and th there are different arrangements. We're not going to really hold you accountable for these. But you can have, for example, one atom in the middle of the unit cell, and you can have um, eight atoms on the outside. You can have uh, six atoms uh, kind of on, on the face of every cell and then uh, eight on the corners. Uh, and this is called face-centered, this is called body-centered, this is primitive. Uh, no need to memorize this, this is more of uh, just appreciating uh, the different types of crystalline arrangements. You can definitely become a crystallographer, a person that studies these uh, and studies solids, how they arrange. So, um, you've got the same thing here, these three uh, arrangements that we saw in the previous slide with really since atoms are you know fill most of the space up they, they look more like this and you, you can do a bunch of calculations um, and you see that a corner atom for example a corner is about an eighth and so forth we're not going to do too much with this this is just an appreciation for the complexity now the way we determine or find out about these structures uh, is something called x-ray crystallography this is a technique in which you shine x-rays through your crystal and those x-rays are what we call diffracted diff undergo diffraction so essentially they interfere with one another in a very regular way and then it, you can take a look at the picture that results and from that picture you can deduce the structure of the crystal this is a pretty complex stuff uh, and nowadays it's done essentially by computers uh, but you, we definitely need to uh, understand how the particles are arranged, and it's done so by x-rays. So here's some more information about that. Feel free to fill it in and, uh, and read the details of it. Um, but uh, x-ray crystallography is a very important uh, part of chemical science. So a few more uh, details of uh, what, how this, how this uh, comes together. So the close packing um, of the crystals, the ordered close packing, uh, gives you this beautiful pattern that you can then uh, work back and find out exactly what, what the crystals should have looked like. And then we'll finish up with uh, taking a look at something called covalent network and molecular solids. So it turns out uh, the solids that um, we talk about, for example, if you have a solid dry ice, Dry ice essentially are molecules of CO2, uh, essentially that uh, have uh, bonded to one another in the solid phase. So molecules of CO2. Uh, but here, this is a totally different type of packing. Remember, we talked about these intermolecular forces um, and intermolecular uh, between molecules. Uh, in these cases, you don't really have intermolecular 
forces. Uh, the whole thing uh, has, it's like a chemical bond all throughout. There are no distinctions between physical chemical bonds, or at least not as clear. So we're going to show you two versions of this. Uh, the first version are, are diamonds. Um, uh, this is a famous version, and diamonds, essentially you get carbon that's covalently networked, um, which just means you have covalent bonds everywhere. It's like a huge network, a three-dimensional arrangement of covalent bonds. Uh, no physical bonds, all chemical bonds. And this is why um, diamond is very, very strong. And these bonds are extremely strong. Diamond is the strongest, uh, hardest substance out there. And diamond has a very, very high melting point, one of the highest melting points on the periodic table, in fact. Uh, so this is because uh, all of these are covalent. They are all, all the bonds are covalent. There are no intermolecular bonds, if you could, if you would. Uh, there's another version of carbon called graphite, and graphite has um, a little bit of these intermolecular forces. These are intermolecular. Uh, but what happens is you get these sheets, you get these molecularly covalently bonded sheets where the atoms are chemically bonded to each other, and then these sheets are held together by what you could say as physical bonds. Um, these have lower melting points, they're not as strong, because um, these bonds here, the intermolecular bonds, are more easily broken. In fact, uh, graphite is very slippery, and this is due to the fact that these can actually move, and the sheets can move past one another. Um, a few words about metallic solids. Anytime you have a metallic solid, what you have is you don't really have um, you don't really have uh, intermolecular bonds either. You have a covalently bonded uh, uh, interactions, just like you had in covalent network solids. Uh, but uh, it's it's the picture is different. What you have is you have electrons that are free to move and delocalized, and that's why metals can conduct electricity well. So, so this is essentially is a different picture altogether from uh, either molecular solids or covalently network solids. And I think this uh, last slide essentially kind of summarizes them all. Feel free to take a look at this, read through. What we've been talking about uh, this whole time, and most of the chapter were molecular uh, compounds, things like um, water and so forth, and uh, the bonding between water molecules. In covalent network, there really is no between water molecules or between molecules because there are no distinct molecules to be thought of. It's The whole thing is a network. Ionic compounds, what we talked about earlier uh, in a previous chapter, which are held together by positive and negative electrostatic forces or attractions. And then finally, metallic uh, is a fourth uh, type of bonding. Uh, scenario. So all five of the, or all four of these are actually very important um, for you to be able to distinguish between um, and you know take a look at the uh, properties of these, take a look at the examples here and uh, study them for your visual pleasure and for some knowledge that we'll come back to in class. So hope you enjoyed this second lesson of, or I'm uh, sorry, this fourth lesson of chapter 11.